5, we hear what might be one of the most radical of Jesus' teachings. It is both challenging and humbling, and yet, in the end, there is a presumption that Jesus does not feel that he's asking really much from us. This is what he says. You have heard that it is what it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and praise for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, so that you may be children of your Creator in heaven. For God makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your kin only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? Therefore, you shall be perfect, just as your Creator in heaven is perfect. Our second reading of the book of Hebrews gives us some insight as to why Jesus thinks that we humans are capable of love with this perfect love of God. Here's what the book says. For it was fitting for God, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many children to glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both the one who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one. For which reason he is not ashamed to call the brethren, saying, I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will sing praise to you. And again, I will put my trust in God. And again, here am I and the children whom God has given me. Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise share in the same, that through death he might destroy that one who had the power of death, that is, the deceiver, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Therefore, in all things, he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself had suffered. Being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. May this reading of these words invite us into a greater awareness of our Creator and ourselves. Amen. Be in a spirit of prayer with me. Holy God, enliven our spirits this morning. Shake us up and call us out. Give us the ears to hear and the eyes to see and the hearts to feel that perfect love that is your very essence. Shock us, surprise us, even startle us. Do whatever it takes to wake us up to the reality of who we are in you. This we ask in the authority and the boldness of Jesus Christ. Amen. What I'm holding right here is a newspaper, and it's dated April 25th, 2009. That's the day that my father died. Less than 10 more minutes uh, before I saw this paper, I'd held my father in his arms and listened as he took his final breath. It was such a surreal experience, largely in part because my father had always told me that he wanted me to hold him as he took his last breath. When he would tell me such things, I would often tell him that there was no guarantee that I would even be present at his death or that I would die first, or he would die first for that matter. 
but still he would insist. And so when I got the call out of nowhere on my daughter's first birthday to come to Mississippi because it didn't look good, I should have remembered his request. But my mind was otherwise occupied. It took a week from the day that I arrived for my dad to surrender his spirit. Through that week, throughout that week, there were several times when the hospice nurse would indicate that it was time, but my dad would not let go. He waited until all of his children were there, as well as his oldest grandchildren. It was an intense time of prayer for me as I watched my dad suffering, and I kept talking to God, asking that I not avert my eyes from my father so that he would not feel alone. Finally, after the fifth or so time of the nurse saying that it was time uh, and my, my dad was still holding on, she asked if my dad was waiting for anyone else. Uh, we told, him, uh, told her no, and she explained that sometimes people hold on because they want to see someone before they leave. That's when my older sister and I both had the realization that my dad was probably waiting for me to hold him. For a fleeting moment, I didn't want to. I didn't want to accept that this was uh, what he was waiting for. Then a flash of selfishness crossed my mind as I thought about all the times that he asked me to hold him when he died. For some reason, the thought that he wouldn't let go until I held him made me feel as if I were trapped in some kind of scripted reality. How could it be possible that the events in our lives would organize themselves in such a way that I was, in fact, guaranteed to be there and hold my dad in the moment of his passing? And then just as quickly as that flash of ego came in, it left and I put my arms around my dad and I said, okay, dad, I'm holding you. I'm doing my part and now you have to do yours. And with that said and done, he let go. For a few minutes, we all wept. And then suddenly I got this feeling that came over me and in my mind's eye, I got this image of my dad still being alive. If you've seen any of those Star Wars movies, you know that when a Jedi dies, other Jedis can still see their spirits. Well, against all rationale, I got this sense that if I went outside, I would find my dad standing there and still alive. So I got up and I walked out the door. When I looked out into the distance where I imagined him to be, I didn't see him. And yet I still got the sense that he was there. That's when I looked up or looked down and I saw this newspaper at my feet. You can't see this, but this is what the headline says. It says, still alive. that morning. So, as soon as I saw that paper, my mind thought of this question. I wonder how differently my dad would have lived if he had known that he couldn't die. I'm going to let that question sink in a little bit. I wonder how my dad would have lived if he knew he couldn't die. And I pose that question to you this morning as we continue to engage this message. So in our second scripture reading today, we heard the author of Hebrews say that Jesus' role in human history is to release those of us who spend our entire lives in bondage because of our fear of death. How many of us have ever heard Jesus' role described that way? And if so, what do you think that means? In the thousands of conversations I've had about Jesus over the years, I can't remember anyone ever describing Jesus' role to me in just that way. Of course, separating the story of Jesus from the story of death is impossible. Without the crucifixion, we probably wouldn't even be talking about him anymore. If he were just a good guy who taught some really nice lessons and lived to a ripe old age, he probably would have been all but forgotten by history. Even with the healings, the feedings of the thousands, the resurrections, and all the other miracles, most of us probably still would not be talking about Jesus. I even think that his own resurrection would not have been enough to keep the Jesus conversation going. Because all of those events, along with the miracles, those are things that we can rationalize away if we want to, and a lot of us do. But we're still talking about them. 
No, I think that what keeps people talking about Jesus more than anything else is the way that he approached death. So why do I think that? It's because none of us can deny that death is the only thing that every breathing creature has in common. It's the great equalizer on this journey, and no matter where we are on that journey, the one thing that we can all agree on is that we have an appointment with death. Whatever we think happens out after that is obviously a matter of faith and possibly open for debate. Now, I know that there's some people who might disagree with me on that. I've talked to people who feel that without the miracles and the resurrection, Jesus can't really do anything for them, and I can see why. And there's a lot of other people who think that Jesus' role in human history is to make their lives go as smoothly as possible. If there are problems, Jesus will fix it. If there's something we want, Jesus will help us get it. If we make choices that are harmful to ourselves and others, Jesus will save us even if we've never invited him into any other aspect of our lives because either consciously or unconsciously, we have come up with this idea that Jesus' role in our lives is to be a genie Santa Claus Superman who makes all of our consequences go away in a single bound. And if he can't do that, then who needs him? In another camp, there are those of us who, for various reasons, have accepted or resigned ourselves to the idea that we may never get the life that we thought we would have in this world. But that's okay, because Jesus' role is to make up for it in the next life. It's like he's an afterlife insurance agent. (laughs) And we might not get what we want here, but it's okay, because we'll get what we want there. And the people who got what they want here, well... We'll love them because, poor souls, they're probably going to (laughs) burn. That's, I mean, (laughs) (laughs) sorry. (laughs) But this is how, this is some of the conversations that I've had over the years. And yet, I think that Jesus' role is much more than that. The context that we know Jesus in is the context that we are all in right now. We're all alive, we all go through things, and one day we're going to all encounter death. So I think that we should try to encounter Jesus where Jesus came to encounter us. And so this makes me think about some of the things that keep us from encountering Jesus as Jesus encounters us. In the first scripture... Jesus talks about loving your enemies. And then he says that by loving your enemies, you'll be perfect, even as your creator in heaven is perfect. This is the same person, and I want us to remember this about Jesus, because I forgot this for a long time. I thought Jesus was this genie Santa Claus Superman who was going to hook me up if I didn't get hooked up here. But when I snapped out of that, I realized in my darkest hour, one of my darkest hours, that this is the same person who said, is there any way that this cup can pass from me? And he was so afraid of what was coming that they say he even sweat blood. This is the same person who on the cross said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When I realized that, that he encountered me in those spaces where I felt forsaken, in those spaces where I said, is it possible that this cup can pass from me? That's when he actually became relatable. And that's when some of the scriptures that sometimes we avoid looking at became very much alive. And then I started thinking, well, maybe if I can accept him in those tough spaces, if he's with me in those tough spaces, maybe he knows something when he says, love your enemies. And so I decided to explore that a little bit. He said that we could be perfect even as our creator in heaven is perfect. And that's a word that I think we really don't uh, have a good understanding of. So I looked it up. And the word used for perfect is a word, Greek word teleos. And there's a lot of ways of uh, defining that word. But one of them is wanting nothing to be complete. In other words, to be complete. And so if we look at it, and this is the verse, the the definition that I'm going to come from, is be complete even as your creator is complete. 
And it says something about how that completion of our creator is manifested. It's that that creator shines the sun on the just and the unjust, that the rain pours on the heads of the evil as well as the good. And so love your enemies. And so in a way, what I come to understand is this uh, question, this thing of loving your enemies, it's a way of being complete. It's a way of remaining complete because no one has the power to make you incomplete. So I was looking, I started hypothesizing about how we experience people as enemies. Like, what does it take to be an enemy? And I came up with three ideas. You don't have to agree with them, but I'm up here now, so might as well listen. (laughs) So number one, in order for someone to be an enemy, that enemy must be able to facilitate a fear experience in you. Without fear, there can be no enemies. The enemy's power comes from fear. Number two, there must be an actual or perceived threat in order to induce that fear experience. That's to say that the enemy must first know what you are afraid of and then must have the ability or resources to follow through on a threat to manifest your fears or at least be able to make you think that they can't. Without both these elements, the chances are that you will not fully experience the person as an actual enemy. So say, for example, someone threatens you and they say, look, I'm going to get in my time machine, I'm going to go back in time, and I'm going to tell George Washington that you are not a real American because you own a Prius. It doesn't matter how serious that person is and how much they mean it, you won't experience that person as a real enemy because they cannot follow through on the threat. It's impossible. And so there's no enemy experience. Number three. uh, you must doubt your own ability to recover from the actualization of that threat. In other words, if you determine that someone has the ability to follow through on their threats, the damage that they can inflict on you has to be something from which you feel inadequate to recover. If someone follows through on the threat of eating your favorite ice cream that you were saving in the fridge, you might get angry, but as soon as you get ice cream again, you're going to get over it because you can recover. So you're not going to call that person your enemy. Or if you're in a relationship, this one might be a tough one. Relationships are tough because sometimes the person can follow through on a threat. And so the person that you love the most might be the one that's most inclined to be able to be experienced as an enemy. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. (laughs) So I'm hoping you get my point. So basically what this all adds up to is that anyone who would qualify as an enemy would have to be someone who you would believe could follow through on a threat to make you incomplete. But when you love your enemies, you're saying, I am complete. I was created complete. I cannot be incomplete. You are not a threat to my my completion. And therefore, I'm going to love you. I'm going to go be good to you. And I'm going to treat you like God treats you. Right? And yet, how easy is it to do that? So here's the error. For the past few sermons, I've been trying to lift up this idea of the name and the idea of identifiers and things like that. And I've been trying to kind of convey to us that who we are with God is the reality of who we are. And this idea of us being without God is false. It is an error. It does not exist. So this idea, we, we, I'm going to say a word that sometimes freaks people out. Now you got to be ready for it. If you, if you know uh, anything about word etymology, you see this arrows missing the target on the front of the bulletin. Okay, so the word is sin, right? Sin. Sin is an archery term, and it means to miss the mark. That's what it means. There are very few people in the world who miss a mark on purpose. Most people miss a mark because they're distracted or they haven't developed their skills enough and they're still in process. There's a lot of different reasons why people miss the mark, but there are very, very, very few people who miss the mark on purpose. And yet we're scared of this word. And I talked about words last week because I want us to understand that the words don't have power over us. We give power to the words. 
by the way that we experience them and by the way that we use them and by the way we allow them to affect us. So this error that we're living out of, this era of us without God, it causes us to miss the mark. It causes us to not be able to love our neighbors. It causes us to not be able to love our enemies. But most importantly, it causes us to not be able to love ourselves. You get that? We were created out of completion. And we still remain complete. As long as we know that we are part of the whole. Jesus, in the, in the scripture, said that the one who sanctifies and the one who being sanctified are one. If we don't know that, we are going to function out of error. And when we function out of error, we are going to sin. It's not a condemnation. It's a way of correcting. It's a way of being able to recognize who you are, to get complete, and to get undistracted and to be able to hit the mark. I'm going to give you one more symbol of it. So some of you, most of you have seen at least one basketball game, right? Because if no one's seen it, then this, this analogy is going to fall flat. Okay, so I'm assuming you've seen a basketball game, and I'm assuming that you know that there's a, there's a hoop, and there's a backboard, and there's a ball. And if the person makes, goes for the shot and they don't make it, what have they done? Sinned. They've sinned. They missed the mark. Now, it might be because they're not really good at basketball. And it might be, let's just say for all intents and purposes, there's a person there. Let's say it's Shaquille O'Neal because I know how many times I used to pray for him to make a free throw. So it's a very real analogy. Let's say it's Shaquille O'Neal. And he's at the line. And he's there. And it's him in the basket. And no one's trying to block him. But everybody around him is like, you stink. You can't do it. You can't make it. You failure. Uh. And they say all this stuff to him. And he goes for the shot. And he misses it. He misses it because he's distracted. He's missing it because he's believing or hearing all of these voices that are telling him he can't do something that he actually can do. Every single day, we go out into this world and there's this crowd. Whether we're in the room by ourselves or we're out in the mall, it doesn't matter. There's this crowd of voices that are telling you that you aren't who you are. They're telling you that there's such a thing as a you without God. And that that you without God is never good enough. You're not pretty enough. You're not tall enough. You're not rich enough. You're too this. You're too that. You're all these other things. And we have all these voices in our heads telling us who we are and who we aren't and what we can and cannot do. And then when we try to take a shot, we miss sometimes. This is an invitation to not miss to say that you are complete and there's nothing that anyone can do about it because that's how God created you. The only one that can stop you from experiencing it is you. When I think about that, I think about my dad. My dad, this dude loved the Bible. He would always be talking about it, but my dad was distracted as all get out. <laughs> and I would talk to him and I would say, Dad, you got to love yourself, man. But he couldn't because of the voices and the distractions and the error that was telling him that there was such a thing as him without God. But right before he died, he realized that it wasn't true. I was sitting in the kitchen by myself before he passed. And all of a sudden, I felt closer to my dad than I had ever felt in my life. And I didn't know what came over me. And my dad ended up calling me. And he said, I'm thinking these crazy thoughts. And I said, what's that? He said, I'm thinking I've never been alone. That's a crazy thought. He started to say, I, I realized that so much of my life, the things I did, the harm I caused, the people I couldn't forgive, it was because I kept feeling like I was alone or I could be, someone can make me be alone. But I was never alone. If I were born in the woods and somebody dropped me off and I never met another person in my whole life, I still was not alone because somebody brought me into the world and that person knew somebody else. So I'm never alone. You're never alone. And one of the things that he got a point to, and I actually have a recording of him saying that, he said that we have to become we because this individual is not true. 
And he said that anytime you feel like you're alone, find somebody and become we. Because we is the only thing that's real. And he said, go find your father. Or go find your mother. Or go find somebody in the street. And if you can't find them, find God. Because if you find God, you are part of the highest we that can ever be. This is who we are. We are one. My hope for this place, this church, this place where people pass through on their journeys, is that we can hold that space. That we can say we are one here. In the United Church of Christ, I came here because it said that, may, that they all may be one. Well, not that we may be one, that we are one. And that we can put an end to this error that says otherwise. So if you find yourself feeling alone, look around, you're not. Walk out of here, not as an individual, but as a we. Carry we with you everywhere you go. And this world will be on earth as it is in heaven. When we all know ourselves as one. Amen.